What's up, Steelers fans? Welcome to Around the Berg. We'll be previewing the Steelers' week two, week three matchup against the Cincinnati Bengals. I'm Mitchell Wolf, your co-host, and with my other co-host here, Shane Kubis. Shane, how you doing tonight? I'm doing all right. You know, hoping uh, hoping for better luck this week coming up. Uh, it's a team that we normally do well against, obviously. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is going to be a pretty tough week because obviously the news, you know, came out that. Ben is, you know, he's got a pretty big injury. He's got this left pectoral injury and, you know, this is, this could be pretty big. You know, I'm not, it's, uh, it's kind of up in the air if he's going to play this week. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think this is a pretty big deal. Yeah. I mean, we all know that Ben really struggles anytime he's feeling it. You know? <laughs> Actually, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, I'm getting something. <laughs> We don't care. Yeah, it doesn't matter even a little bit. <laughs> you know, it's funny because we've seen, obviously, a lot of people have joked about it too. Like, everyone's saying, oh, career game coming in for Ben, you know, at age 39. Like, it's so – it's at this point comical how the, you can – like clockwork, he's going to get injured. He's not going to actually probably miss games. Or if he does, it's like one game, like a knee thing, and then he comes back and he's fine or he's playing mm-hmm. better than ever. And it's like, okay, like, honestly, it's sometimes you feel like, yeah, he needs to get nicked up a little bit and then we'll be all right. You know, he'll, yeah, I mean, like, I, I feel like he was probably somewhat nicked up for that, like, two game stretch in 2014 where he threw like 12 touch. Or, like, he had to have been, right? Yeah. Like, like and, and again, like a left pectoral is perfect because like, it's a little bit of pain, mm-hmm. but it's pretty much not a big deal, you know? So like, I, I'm, ex- again, I'm expecting him, like you said, to have a career day. Like I have, my expectations are, if anything, heightened for him this week, especially against an opponent that he you know, knows so well. Uh, yeah. But on, on a serious note, the Steelers do have some, a lot of injury concerns going into this week. So obviously last time we t- mentioned that Tyson Alualu fractured his ankle yeah. against the Raiders. And it seems like he's going to miss the rest of the season, which sucks, especially with uh, Stefan to still on injured reserve. So yeah. defensive line is pretty banged up, which, you know, the Steelers were able to play decently against the run last week, but again, the Raiders weren't really trying to run the ball. And Yeah, it was tough to gauge how much Alu was a loss in that game because they really, one, they didn't try to run the ball, and even when they mm-hmm. did, it was pretty noticeable that it was just to kind of give us a different look, nothing too crazy. Nothing exactly. So. Yeah, and like, and again, still, luckily, like, you know, they still have Chris Wormley, who's a solid rotational player who's been played pretty well so far. Mm-hmm. You know, I, Isaiah Bugs is a very pretty competent nose tack, especially as a run defender. And uh, I think Carlos Davis missed the last game with a little he, injury, but I, I, I think, think he's so, back yeah. this week. Yeah. yeah he's, and he's been getting some praise. Yeah. yeah a lot so, of people yeah. like him. I think he's going to be a good player. Uh, so, you know, again, not a cat, not a, uh, of the injuries, probably the least catastrophic, but yeah, you know, still kind of sucks. Um, the other two would be TJ Watt and Deontay Johnson. They both, I think well, TJ Watt was a groin. Deontay was a knee injury. And I think of the two, it seems like Deontay is more likely to play, but they both could as of recording this Wednesday night. So, you know, we didn't have the Hayden Bush injuries until Friday. So, you know, things could obviously change yeah. by the time we record our next episode and the game happens. If I had to guess, if one of them doesn't play, it's probably Watt mm-hmm. for a combination of one more impactful guy to lose if he goes down further. Mm-hmm. And also we have the receiver depth to, to see, you know, to, Mm -hmm. well, yeah. So like Johnson, if he plays, I'm expecting him to play a limited role, probably like just be Mm -hmm. in there for some certain plays and then have Washington take over a lot of that receiver role. So yeah, we've seen Washington come in a decent, like take a few snaps to just kind of spell guys. So, you know, it'll just be more of a true rotation, almost like they ideally wanted with um, Highsmith and Ingram. Although apparently Highsmith is a little dinged up as well. I'm not sure he's done the, so he's kind of working through that. So let's see. And then, I mean, Ingram has been really great so far. So if he's mm-hmm. on the field, that's not a huge problem. Uh, like we mentioned, uh, Ben obviously has his left pectoral injury. That's not going to be a big deal. Uh, yeah. And then I think we're still waiting on word about Joe Hayden and Devin Bush. I would imagine they'll probably be ready to go, but we'll see. Seems like it so far. Yeah, it didn't seem like they were because I feel like if they were injuries that were more than just like a, a like a games game day scratch probably would have heard more about it by now. So for sure. And I think of, again, of those two, I think Hayden is the bigger loss just because obviously the Steelers secondary struggled a bit last week and the Bengals are bringing a very talented receiving core into Pittsburgh this weekend. So really hope both those guys can go. Uh, In the meantime, some transactions on the wire. We saw Henry Mondo get signed to the active roster. Uh, He played a lot of special teams last year and even got in when some other guys went down with injury. He's, you know, 
He's. I don't think he's going to play very much on, he's, his, on he, defense. He's a guy. He's a guy that we can go to if we need to get some of these guys out for a couple of plays, and he knows the system. So yeah. I think it's mostly just obviously a depth move. Bring somebody mm-hmm. in that we know will be able to do what we wanted to do. So yeah, and maybe because they they might consider moving Wormley to the nose tackle if they're more comfortable hit because he can play both. So he yeah. might be more comfortable there, and they can play some of the other guys and who are more specific to that role. And then the other one is. Uh, a, another signing to the practice squad, another first round player to go along with Carl Joseph is Taco Charlton, who was a mm-hmm. first round pick by the Dallas Cowboys in the same draft as TJ Watt, I believe only one or two picks after him. Yeah. And, you know, he's kind of bounced around a few teams. I know he's been on the cow. Cal- he was on the Cowboys. He was on the chiefs for a little bit. I think he's been on at least one or two other teams and bigger guy, big, tall, long defensive end. I'm not exactly sure how he fits as into the scheme because he's kind of even between a three, four outside linebacker and a defensive end. Um, but yeah. I mean, at this point, he's just a practice squad body, really. I think ideally he he doesn't really have the agility or the bend to be a three, four mm-hmm. guy for me. So I feel like he's probably going to be maybe if he were to come up and have to play probably like as an inside out rusher because he's kind of yeah. like tweener size. So you could probably mm-hmm. move him in and outside, you know, depending yeah. on what you're doing. Yeah, probably not going to play him much on rundowns. You want to see no, if you can yeah. find some matchups with him as a pass rusher. So, you know, a, a pretty minor signing, but he's the first former first round pick. So that's interesting. Uh, other news we got no suspension for Trey Turner or Solomon Thomas yet for the alleged spitting incident between the two. Yeah. Uh, Tomlin, I think, basically still backed up Trey Turner and his story, but Trey, you know, said he profusely apologized to Tomlin. And, you know, that's, that's why I think that. Thomas or somebody had to have done something because Turner's he's been in this league a long time. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he, I don't think he's going to go off like this on somebody, especially in COVID times with something like that, unless he was provoked, maybe not necessarily by spitting, but you know, uh, again, obviously that's, that's, you know, really bad. That's not okay. But I, I, again, this is kind of not, not as bad, but he's something akin to the Mason Rudolph, Miles Garrett incident where I, I'd be very shocked if he wasn't provoked. Yeah, it's one of those things where, like, when a guy like him that has no track record with this type of stuff mm-hmm. does something that egregious, mm-hmm. you there, you have to assume, even though he's not in the right, you know something happened that was abnormal, right? Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't it wasn't just some like getting trash talked or whatever, because guys handle that all the time. It's, it must have been something else specific. So, yeah, and it looks it, if you watch the if I remember watching the replay of it, it seems like him and Ben and maybe somebody else like trying to talk to the ref and the ref isn't hearing him. And then Turner goes off and, you know, kind of takes the law into his own hands, if you will, and yeah. does something. So I again, just, that, so. yeah, just yeah. a very, a very odd situation. Yeah, and then sure. we'll stick with the offensive line just in terms of news. So Tomlin had his press conference, at least one of them this week. And he said that he's not making changes to the offensive line, which personally I'm, I'm very much okay with at this point. Um, Cause like I've been saying, you know, it's it's tough because this line needs time to play together, work together. I know Zach Banner said something. Can he's like, hey, like these plays are close. It's just not everybody's executing perfectly every time. Like one or two guys are, but it's just not all five, and that just takes time. And the 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 bad part of that is, it's just as the Steelers are still trying to be a playoff team, the time is short, and you know you have expectations of that happening quicker than it's going to, and. You know, I know some Steelers fans are like, oh, the Matt Canada experiment has failed all of two games into the season. And it's like, you, <sighs> I, I know I know it sucks. We have to give it time. But as Steelers fans, you really just need to be patient. Like it's there's this, there's nothing that's going to solve this. Like if anything, switching it up is, might make it worse because you're going to kind of ruin what little chemistry is being built. So like even when Zach Banner comes back, like I'm not sure if they're going to be unless, you know, Chicks core four continues to be a complete liability. I'm not sure they're going to be super excited to you know, switch somebody in and out of the lineup. Yeah. And you're the whole thing with Canada and the offense. And there's been a lot of people breaking it down and talking about it. Like the, the problem with it is with, with his offense, obviously there's a lot of college principles, a lot of motion, all that good stuff. It's designed to try to help. Uh, it really is going to be a good fit for what we're trying to accomplish right now, because these guys haven't played with each other very much. Mm-hmm. The, it's going to be a simplified offense for the most part. They, they need to have time to figure this out, like you said, especially on the offensive line. So much of offensive line play is about continuity. If you look at, like, the Browns in Baker Mayfield's rookie year, one of the best lines in the NFL, there's no real frontline starters outside of um, – I can never remember his name, the guard they have, Batonio. Oh, yeah. But outside yeah. of him, like, there wasn't any true, like, big-time frontline starters, but all, all those guys played all 16 games. Mm-hmm. They figured it out, and they, they rolled with it. Sometimes it's not about – 
the pure talent level, especially at offensive line, it's about getting into a rhythm with each other. Because when you know what everyone else is doing, it's a lot easier to handle stunts, a lot easier to direct guys out of traffic. Like it just it's a lot, you know, to 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 do. And with Canada's offense, it's gonna take some time, probably till the middle of the season before we really see how good they can be this year. Right. And, you know, as an example, I can't remember ex- if which one of them it was, but between Marquise Pounce and David DeCaster, who are obviously two of the arguably the best linemen in Steelers history, you know, yeah. I think on their first play together, somebody stepped on somebody else's foot and they tore their ACL. So something like you know, they that. Missed, yeah, yeah, I think so. I can't remember who did it was one. It was they were involved. I can't remember which one tore their knee thing, but it was one of them, too. And it was on their first place. So, like, that's just a perfect example of, you know, how that chemistry builds over time. And, you know. Obviously, we're talking about continuity and you know trends over time, and that kind of brings us to our sponsor, which is Symbol. Yeah, which go. Symbol is the stock market for sports, where you can buy and sell virtual shares of your favorite teams using real money. Each time your team wins, you're in a win payout. If your team loses, you lose nothing. Symbol offers trading for the NFL, NBA, MLB, with college football coming this fall. Visit www.symbol.app today and use promo code STEALERSATB to earn a ten dollar deposit on your first bonus. That's www.sim. B U L L dot app. Okay. So like we said, the Steelers have their rivals quote, uh, the, Cin- <laughs> the Cincinnati Bengals this weekend, uh, another home game at one o'clock, which I think I'll actually be able to watch at home this time, which will be nice. But so the Bengals like the rest of the AFC North sit at one and one. They had a kind of surprising week one victory against the Vikings in overtime, uh, after coming back from a pretty big deficit. And then this past week, they got pretty much trounced on the road against the bears after Joe Burrow threw three interceptions on three consecutive passes, which hasn't happened since Ryan Fitzpatrick did it in 2018, which again, something that makes a ton of sense. (laughs) I don't know if you know what's up, but is that the chiefs game where he threw like six picks? Is that the same game? That might be that. that, that That's sounds well, I feel like I'm trying to think what team he was on back then. I think that would have been, yeah, no, I think that was the Steelers actually. No, no, sorry. Not the Steelers, the Buccaneers. Buccaneers. No, I think you're right. Was it that game? If it was 28, no, I don't, was it three straight? I don't. I don't I've, think so. I don't want to take too much time to get into it, but yeah. I immediately, the, my immediate thought was was the Chiefs game where he threw six. Picks I I know guys. which one you're talking you know about. I don't, talking yeah, that was no. brutal. So. It might no because I'm 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 pretty certain it was on the Bucks. I just can't remember what the opponent was, but right, yeah. you know. But I mean, that just tells you all you need to know about Ryan Fitzpatrick is that oh, there's all these games where he's had these tons of interceptions where it's been catastrophic. But yeah, anyway, so right now Bengals are kind of what we expected, you know. Their offense has been good at times. At other times, Zach Taylor seems varying over his head. Their offensive line is still struggling, and Taylor seems to not be putting them and Joe Burrow in good positions. But I think their defense seems to be getting a little better, which, you know, good for them. With the addition of Mike Hilton, of course. Of course, yeah. I, You know, the, Peng- the Bengals are so tough because I feel like from an offensive standpoint, roster-wise, outside of obviously they still need to figure out, you know, who's their long-term players on the offensive line. You know, all that good stuff, but they have all the playmakers both mm-hmm. in, on at the running back position with Joe Mixon and then the trio of receivers and you know Auden Tate's up there with probably one of the best mm-hmm. fourth receivers. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's really about to me, Zach Taylor has disappointed me a lot as an offensive coach because he's he was brought in as that I believe he was under that like McVay tree of guys and yeah, you know, he met yeah. McVay at a bar one time. Right. And, and then he know. gets a head coaching job. But no, it's whenever you're Specialty is offense, and you have all these guys here now. And Burrow's back healthy; he looks healthy mm-hmm. at least. Like obviously had some struggles in the Bears game, but came back strong at the end and looked pretty good against the Vikings. When you have all these pieces, you have to maximize those guys, and he hasn't been able to do that both with limited talent trying to maximize them or with the talent he has now. It's early on; we'll see what he can do. But I think a lot of Bengals fans would agree with me too that I think that that experiment with him has probably run his course. And they're going to have to look for a guy, probably, you know, Joe Brady, possibly <laughs> to come in and, uh, you know, re- maybe reunite with Burrow, something along those lines. I think that's what's going to need to happen if they want to make- take that next step. Yeah. I mean, Joe Brady's doing a nice job of saving Sam Darnold's career thus yeah. far in Carolina. So, yeah, you know, sure. I think the, the the seat for Zach Taylor's warm pretty quickly. And, you know, I'm, I'm, on one hand, you know, it's a little unfair. Like, like you said, like this is really his first opportunity with the entire cast of, Characters yeah. again, the offensive line is still leaving a bit to be desired, but he does have Joe Burrow. He does have Joe Mixon, who's an excellent running back, one of the best, like you said, receiving cores in the league. So, you know, it's it's gotta be time to put it. It's it's 
got to be time for them to put it all together soon. You just, you know, hope maybe it doesn't come exactly this week. Um, so right, yeah. under Mike Tom, the Steelers are 23 and six against the Bengals and 11 and three at home during that stretch. So yeah. that's a pretty good track record. And, you know, the Steelers obviously lost the Bengals on the road last year. And I feel like every few years they're due for a Bengals loss. So, you know, if we keep that trend going, this shouldn't be one of those. Uh, yeah, you hope not. I mean, it's, the problem with a lot of teams in the division now, especially the Browns, obviously are much better than we than they ever were before, and we have a whatever record against them, some even more ridiculous than the Bengals' record. Mm-hmm. The Bengals are still getting better; like they're a better football team than they were last year. You can tell. Yeah. So it's this is not the type of game that was it was even last year outside of the the disappointing loss that we had. Yeah. It's Brian Finley of all people. You know, he's not even yeah. on the team. I don't think. Um, so this could be one of those trap games. I think if we had beat the Raiders last week pretty mm-hmm. soundly, mm-hmm. I'd be a little bit more concerned about this being that trap game. Mm-hmm. But because of the fact that we did disappoint against the Raiders for the most part, coming off of that game, I do expect the team to really be up for this game with the injuries mm-hmm. and everything else. So I'm not as worried about that creeping into it. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely agree with that trap game statement. Um, So, uh, so we wrote down some matchups that we think will be pretty interesting for this game. And I'm going to ask you like, so if you want to, if you had to pick a matchup in this game to watch and focus on, which one are you going to go with? I think it's going to be how our secondary, especially if Hayden is still not hundred percent healthy, how do they match up with this receiving core? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, even last year, like Tyler Boyd's always been difficult to deal with in Mm -hmm. the slot. T Higgins is a very good wide receiver as an outside threat. And Chase has thr- shown the ability in two games to get deep on teams, and we mm-hmm. saw what happened last last game with Rugs. Mm-hmm. I'm a little concerned about you know who's best to cover him. Mm-hmm. Probably Hayden gets him if he's healthy. I'd mm-hmm. assume maybe, and then you put Sutton on you know either Boyd in the slot if you want to move him inside sometimes, or you put him out on Higgins. But I'm a little concerned about how that matches up with them because they they do go truly four deep at receiver if you throw out mm-hmm. Tate in there. So that's probably the biggest thing on defense, you know, with our pass rush also possibly not being fully healthy there. How well can our coverage hold up over the course of the game? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think, I think you're right that Hayden would probably go with chase because like we've said, you know, Joe Hayden doesn't necessarily rely on his speed to win, you know, and so in chase isn't, doesn't really either. So it's not like chase is just going to torch, no. Hayden over the top with his feet alone. And, you know, he would try to use his savvy and his positioning where, and Hayden, Hayden can do a good job of countering that based on his experience in the league. Mm-hmm. And then I think you're right, Jamie, but James Pierre on T Higgins, he's a bit of a bigger, longer corner. So he can yeah, he would have combat that. And then Sutton right. is, you know, a pretty solid slot corner. So that's a ideal matchup for Boyd. So I think you've got those matchups pegged really well in terms of my kind of more general matchup to watch. I think for both teams, the trenches are going to be really interesting. So like yeah. you mentioned with that, with the Steelers pass rush, you know, if if Watt can go, that's obviously best case scenario. You know, lining him up against I don't even know who their right tackle is. It's, um, I think it would it, be uh, was it Reef right now still? It is Reef. It is Riley yeah, Reef. You're right. You're absolutely right. Hurt. Yeah, yeah. So and Reef is a solid player, but I th- he's one of those guys that like. And I argued with a lot of people about this when they made that move, and people saying, "Well, we got Reef to play right that, tackle." So mm-hmm. it's like, listen, Reef's he's a better player than they've had at right tackle for a while. That's right? true. He's, he's, a, he's a professional right tackle, which yeah. means that he's not going to embarrass himself, right? Yes, yeah. When your quarterback is coming off an ACL tear, mm-hmm. he, I don't know if I'm okay with just saying he's good enough, right? Like, yeah. And I understand Chase is a great player. A lot of the stuff about him is overblown you know, coming into the season with the drops and stuff. But this had this was a team that had the receiving talent that it mm-hmm. wasn't like Burrow was going to have nobody to throw to. Right. Right. And that's my concern with this team moving for it is the decision making like that the same thing with like the dolphins taking you know, not want to talk about them too much but taking a receiver mm-hmm. like the tackles in this class have played very well especially sewell and slater like they've played really well at their respective positions and to me it's more valuable to have a above average lineman than it is to have even a great receiver in this league considering how hard it is to find offensive linemen for sure yeah and so you know if if let's just we'll say that tj watt doesn't play so we'll get some combination of alex highsmith and melvin ingram starting and right. I, I still like that matchup with the steelers i like really like the interior matchup of cam hayward versus i jackson carmen trey hopkins and some guys, yeah. idea else playing right guard you know i i not i say this not because i think i'm i'm just giving the Bengals, just because they've got a pretty big rotating 
uh, revol- uh, revolving door there at yeah. I think it might be Quentin Spain actually who's a so a good run he's blocker. A, he's actually been pretty good. Yeah, another year, another honestly. kind of just professional lineman who's you right. know not going to like you said not going to embarrass themselves. But yeah, so I, I really like that matchup for Cam Hayward. You know, I'm not sure Chris Wormley or um, any of the other guys who they're going to rotate it will be able to make a huge impact that'd be great if they could but if they don't i'm not gonna be heartbroken about it yeah so you know that's the one side of the coin you know those guys are gonna have to get more pressure than they did last week against the raiders and then on the other side you know we've talked at it about it at length is you know the steelers offensive line getting going because the Bengals have a pretty solid defensive line themselves they've got dj reader who's back healthy larry okanjobi who's been a really solid player in the afc north for a while they've got you know, they've got some new guys. They got Sam Hubbard back, who's a good defensive end, and Trey Hendrickson, who they signed over from the Saints this offseason to big money. So, you know, again, like this is a pretty maybe not the formidable pass rush of the early 2010s when it was, you know, Geno Atkins and Carlos Dunlap and uh yeah, those teams who was were... it, Michael Johnson, I think, or something. Yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. was there for a long time. Yeah, those yeah. those big long ends gave the Steelers a lot of trouble around yeah. those times. But you know, these guys are still solid players, but you know, obviously the offensive line has had their struggles. So, you know, one can this offensive line protect Ben? Can they pick him up after somebody knocks him down? We saw some, yeah. some, I think <laughs> Kevin Dotson, Kevin Dotson, as the quote elder statesman of the group said something that we're not letting it happen yeah. again. So that's good. Uh, good but then obviously up. the other thing is, you know, can they get the run game going? As we've said every week, you know, can they, can Najee Harris break the 50 yard rushing marker this week? Can he, <laughs> I, I did hear a really interesting stat though, that he, so he had 38 yards yesterday or on Sunday and, 34 of those were yards after contact, which is bad. Yeah, but it's not good. That's, but it's, that's a great credit to him, but it is bad. Right. Cause, and this is the problem, right? Is like people are going to look at people who don't understand. And I don't, I understand like so many people, they focus on like box score stats or like fantasy and all that stuff. And like they're going to look at Najee so far and be like, ah, oh, man, maybe, you know, first round pick. It's like, but you have to understand when you watch him play, he's so much better yeah. than his stats would suggest. And, that's what's so disappointing is like if, mm-hmm. if he just wasn't figuring it out, if he wasn't making the right decisions, if he mm-hmm. was being risky with the football, he was fumbling, Trent like, Richardson, Trent, Trent right. Richardson. <laughs> yeah. The where, you know, there's 10 yeah. feet of space yeah. and you go the, through the two foot hole. Yeah. You, if he was doing that stuff, then I'd be like, all right, you know, I, what am, what am I going to say? But he clearly has it figured out. We knew he was the line just has to give him even a little bit of space. Like it doesn't have yeah. to be as crazy. He doesn't have to roadblock guys or there doesn't have to be eight foot gaps for him to run through. Just give him a head start where he's not making somebody miss two yards in the backfield. Like, we yeah, just can't and like and you know, again, like we know that he's not like an Anthony McFarland type of player where he has that incredible short area explosiveness agility where he can make guys, you know, miss in that very small amount of area. Like he is more of a power back. And, but even so, like we see him when he gets out and into space on like these, and he, like we said, he caught all five of his targets against the uh, Raiders took one for a touchdown. You know, if he is in space, like he can make people miss and use his physicality to grind out extra yards. So, you know, we just want to like get him, you know, maybe one or two extra yards before contact. And then, you know, if he gets his momentum going, then he can really start being able to see him being a really effective threat on the ground. Yeah, we'll be in business if we can get him. Like, because he, again, he's not a pure power back in the sense that like he's not going to be able to make guys miss in the hole. But if he has to do it every play, that's not going to be successful. There's not right. many guys who have that ability, and he's more of a space player once he does get his momentum going and he can do his jump cuts and and make guys miss or stiff arm him. He's he he needs that space to be able to do some of the stuff that we saw him do at Alabama that got us so excited. Exactly. And until that happens, he's probably going to disappoint in the box score a little bit for mm-hmm. fans, but I think he's going to look great. And even if the line doesn't do that for him, so for sure. And then kind of, so this is kind of the next level of the, another match we want to talk about is I think the one area the Steelers should be attacking on the Spangles defense, is their linebackers, because they're all quite young. They're not the best. I think Logan Wilson is a pretty solid player. He seems to be developing quite nicely for them, but yeah. You know, Jermaine Pratt is a limited player. I'm not sure if they're going to run out Akeem Davis Gaither there a ton, except maybe just on passing downs. But, you know, f- we we saw that graphic where Ben was never really throwing anything in that intermediate mm-hmm. 10 to 20 yards over the middle between the numbers area of the field. You know, he just wasn't targeting that against the Raiders defense. And, you know, I think you can make an argument that that area is very well protected by the Raiders defensive scheme as a Seattle cover three. But, you know, that's an area of the field that you do need to be attacking because like you've been saying for weeks, you know, if you attack the middle of the field and you're successful in that, that does help you open up 
the vertical shots down the seams and down the sidelines. And, you know, Steelers were able to attack the sidelines a little bit fairly well against the Raiders, I thought. Yeah. And, you know, if they can start, you know, utilizing Pat Fryermuth more in that area of the field, you know, finding Juju a few yards deeper as opposed to just running five yard hitches in front, right in front of Ben's face, you know, yeah. get him on some deeper crossers doing stuff like that. You know, that is another thing that'll really help open up the offense. Yeah. That middle of the field, especially like obviously last week and you mentioned it too, when, whenever I, I know I tagged you in that, that mm-hmm. next gen stats, I, it totally makes sense why that wasn't a, a big tra- traffic area for us mm-hmm. against that scheme. But it's still whenever you have guys like Firemuth who we hope to get going, mm-hmm. and you have guys that are the physical receivers like Juju, get them in the middle of the field against linebackers who aren't going to be able to run with them. Get them in you know momentum going and get up the field because once they get into that like ten to twenty yard range in the middle of the field, and they get past those linebackers. Those safeties aren't going to want to come up and hit them. Mm-hmm. They're going to be able to run. like you saw Juju run over guys two or three times mm-hmm. in the Raiders game, and that yeah. was on these quick passes where he didn't have his full momentum going half mm-hmm. the time. Like get those guys in positions to get those 10, 15, 20 yard chunk plays in the middle of the field where those throws aren't as hard for a guy who is getting pressured for a guy who is 39 years old. Mm -hmm. Like those sideline throws, you know, he's been great at them for a long time, but giving him easier completions to get into a rhythm. That's the best way we can kind of get this offense moving forward and and not have so many of those three and outs and short drives that go 10, 15 yards. Then we punt the more we have of those, especially with the defense that is depleted a little bit right now, mm-hmm. that's how you end up losing to a team like the Raiders or you lose to a team like the Bengals that aren't you know, really quite there yet, but could beat you at any given day. So I'm mm-hmm. hoping to see a lot of that with Friarmouth, especially. Yeah. And like, yeah, and I heard a stat today. I think something that was basically the, to the effect of that, the Steelers defense has been on the field for about 50 more plays than the offense has been out. And, yeah. you know, we're seeing that take effect in the form of injuries. You obviously, that's not a direct correlation, but you know, the more time the defense is on the field, the more you have to deep dig. You have to dig deep into your depth on the roster. To here. thank you, <laughs> uh, the more you have to you know do that to your roster to find guys who are you know fully fresh. That's why we saw Jameer Jones get a good healthy amount of snaps against the Raiders, and that's not ideally not really something you want this early in the year. Right. So yeah. you know, and like like I've been saying, you know, I think I heard some people saying like if the offense didn't look good last game, or they even looked worse in the first game. I'm like. They looked, I thought it looked a lot better because mainly they yeah. weren't going three and out every other drive. Like, I mean, yeah. they had, they had more punts in the first half against the bills than they had the entire game against the Raiders. And, you know, I know they had a turnover on downs, been through a pretty bad interception, but you know, that's some of that's not his fault because right. Deontay kind of gave up on the route, but you know, it, the offense is at least was at least moving, you know, it wasn't finishing as well as we'd hope, but you know, it was at least getting there. And, you know, I think that again, we talked about it earlier, like, you just have to be a little patient, you know, things people still are figuring things out with this team i think with ben attacking the middle of the field i'm i'm i have to wonder if part of it is he's not as confident in his arm strength in terms of velocity and ability to force it into tight windows because you know that's the other element of arm strength is you know, obviously you want distance like you know patrick mahomes and dustin herbert josh allen the other thing i'll fling it 80 yards down the field but you know another bigger arguably more important part of it yeah, is being able okay. to fire it into you know, and this is, and you know, against that defense, you know, he's like, okay, I'm not super comfortable trying to fit it in between two linebackers and safety in this one little, you know, coin sized hole in the field where I should have to fire it right there and be perfectly accurate. So, you know, I'm wondering if maybe as the year goes on, he kind of, you know, obviously he's hurt, so he's going to be feeling better. You know, he'll come into his arm and be like, okay, like I feel more confident that I can fire this deep dig or deep crosser to Juju right there. And, you know, we can start getting some big yardage that way. And I think, uh, again, like that's a big part of Matt Cannon's offense is that play action, you know, kind of deep crossers being an integral part of how he wants to run the offense. Yeah. And I totally understand like from Ben's perspective, if he doesn't feel comfortable with those tougher throws right now, you know, I, it's one of those things where obviously you don't like to hear that as a fan, mm-hmm. but I, at the same time, if that's true, I'd rather him not force mm-hmm. something he doesn't want to do. But for me, like you have to just take advantage of matchups, right? Like the Bengals, they're going to be softer in the middle of the field in that 10 to 20 yard range with the linebackers there. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's going to be the case. So you have to scheme stuff up to get those guys open in space in the middle of the field, you know, whether it's against zone coverage, sitting down in zones, 10 to 15 yards, you know, finding soft spots there where linebackers aren't give Ben throws that he's confident he can make because they are you know relatively wide open, at least by NFL standards. Like if he's trying to force stuff in the middle of the field, that's not what I want to see because that's how balls end up in the air in the middle of the field and stuff like that. But it, trying to get some guys that are clearly open in the middle of the field, scheming out purposely, 
is I think how Canada can help remedy that a little bit. And that's when you can then hopefully, even though he's been trying to do it a lot more, which is great, have some more quality shots down the sidelines to Claypool mm-hmm. and Johnson, stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, if, if that doesn't work, you know, if Ben's still not there, I don't think this corner room is a lot to be really scared of. You know, Mike Hilton, obviously, you know, we loved him as a sealer, but I think a lot of people recognize his limitations as a coverage defender. Yeah. Uh, and then they've got Chidobia Wuzier, who's a free agent from the Cowboys, is one of their starting outside corners, who's, uh, you know, kind of another solid player. He's a professional, maybe not going to get totally embarrassed a ton. But, mm-hmm. and then on the other side, it was Trey Waynes, who, again, I, th- I think used to pretty much be a slot corner, but now he's playing more outside. But he's kind of hurt, so they're playing Eli Apple out there. And, if you know anything about Eli Apple, that is a major liability for a defense if he's one of your starting corners. Yeah. So you know, I think I think hopefully the Steelers' offense this might be the this might be there. And I think I said this last year against the uh, for the road game for the Bengals. Oh, this will be the get right game for the playoffs. Yeah, and that, that didn't all, happen. So yeah, the offense then, like I mean, is people. That's the other thing is people have these expectations, obviously, for the Steelers' offense yeah. from the mid 2010s, mm-hmm. right? And I totally get that. Like we were high flying, mm-hmm. doing crazy stuff. You know. Having you know more talent than now, but not that much more talent realistically. I mean, you're the, you're the best running back and the best right. wide receiver in football for a good right. amount of like, time. And like so, and that's part of it too. The offensive line was real, obviously a big that part too. of that too. Yeah. So that those days aren't here. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. if you're a fan and you're waiting for that, I'm sorry if that's what your yeah. expectations are. You're gonna be upset. But yeah. a lot of people aren't giving this team any chance to get better on offense. Like I did uh, a report card for Ben for the last game for mm-hmm. the Steel Curtain, and all the comments are washed. Uh, he lost. So how could he be better than last week if they lost, which I'm like, uh, you already lost me on that one. You can't, can't use that argument on me, but it's one of those things where when you're in the position where the Steelers are right now with the new offense, you just want to see improvement. You don't want to see backward steps. Mm-hmm. That's whenever, like if you start seeing backward steps, that's when I'll get up here and be like, this is not good. Yeah. Right. Like until that happens though, I'm going to try to be optimistic because when you're as, when you're as far back as we were offensively at the end of last year in the week mm-hmm. one, you see any life, you're like, all right, we have a chance. Here, that, that's know? what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And again, like, I don't think we're necessarily asking it to, or at least we aren't, are not asking not. it to be the offense of the mid 2010s. You know, I'm just, just be, you know, between 16th and maybe 20th in the league, you know, be competent, allow the defense to not be on the field for most of the game, you know, give them right. the ability to rest and, you know, study and get ready for the next drive, you know, and just maybe score at least two touchdowns, maybe, yeah. maybe a little more. <laughs> it's really just about balance with this team, right? Like, yeah, I want to sure. get to a point where like we can rush for a hundred yards in a game if we have to. Right. Yeah. Cause right now I don't think that's such a low bar, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, but like, I feel like right now though, like if I had, if I had to bet my life on the Steelers rushing for hundred yards on Sunday, I'd be very concerned. With oh my yeah. Life. No question. And it's like, even if they made a concerted effort, I just don't know if they could do it right now. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want to see. Cause I'm not expecting Ben to make this huge leap back up into a top five quarterback. And yeah. those who might feel that way, I'm sorry. No. I don't think he's got it in him, no. but he doesn't have to be that guy. If they mm-hmm. ask him to be that guy, then that's the fault of the offense. That's the mm-hmm. fault of the team. You got to get Harris to be the, the feature guy there. You got to get the underneath guys and Fryer Muth, those guys, you got to get them going, let them make plays for Ben and you'll be all right. Just be a top, like you said, 16 ish, you know, half top half of the league offense. This defense, especially when it gets back healthy, will be able to manhandle a lot of these teams. So, Absolutely. So with that talk of touchdowns and scoring, we'll get into our predictions. Uh, so right now, I think on most books, the Steelers are favored by about three and a half. Mm-hmm. The over-under is 43 and a half. So, we're lo- so most books are predicting it to be something along the lines of 23 to 20, 24 to 20-ish. So with that in mind, Shane, I'll throw it to you. What is your prediction for this game? Uh, I'm going to take the over just barely uh, 24-21 Steelers okay. is, my, is my bet. I think this is going to be a very close game. I think it could honestly come down to a you know Boswell field goal last drive mm-hmm. possibly because I think both defenses, the Steelers' case because of the injuries and the Bengals' case just because I think, like you said, they're a little bit better than they were mm-hmm. last year. I think they'll both have pretty good days overall, and it's going to come down to you know who has the ball ass and has a chance to get some points to, to win the game. So. Yeah, and I am I have my score written down. I'm going to change a little bit. I'm going to go with the over as well, but I'm going to go with 27-20. I'll give the Steelers another field goal and, you know, the Bengals one less touchdown and two more field goals or something like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, uh, still I think a lot up in the air specifically for this defense. You know, I think if T.J. Watt 
we knew his status, if we knew Joe Hayden or Devin Bush's status, we'd be more confident about the defense right. holding them to less points. But as we stand now, I think the defense can still perform against this team. You know, there's still have a lot of questions as well. And I think the offense is, you know, it's going to be incremental, but I think they're going to keep making minor improvements on a week to week basis. So by the time they get into kind of the meat of their schedule in the middle of the year, they'll, you know, be emphasis on the quotes humming along. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. All right. So that'll do it for us. This episode again, game is at 1 PM on Sunday. I believe it's on CBS as usual. So with that, Shane, let people know where they can find your work. So you found me at Shane Kubis on Twitter and you find obviously everything with Steelers ATB with around the block. And then you can also find my writing a lot of it at still. Absolutely. And I'm, like I said, I'm at Mitchell T Wolf, W O L F E on Twitter. Uh, we had our recap, the Steelers game go live, uh, at least my written one of it earlier this week. And of course I'll be doing my preview of the game with some matchups to watch for like the ones we talked about today, along with other stuff. And like Shane said, make sure you're following at Steelers ATB on Twitter and checking out our work at around the block. So we thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next week. Have a good one.